Hello, I'm Justin Clement, a volunteer with the Valley Forge Park Alliance. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce you to the speaker series sponsored by the Sharon H. and Bruce A. Bakey Foundation. Um, so today we have a very interesting talk, but starting off, I have a few announcements to make. Uh, first of all, first off, we have a one more speaker series event coming up June 1st with Brendan Burns. He's a genealogist with the Daughters of the American Revolution and should have a very interesting talk about documenting your ancestor from the Revolutionary War. Second, we are kicking off the Lunch and Learn series. That begins on May 26th uh, in celebration of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Uh, we have a talk entitled After the Fashion of His Country, Asia and Asians in the 18th Century in Mid-Atlantic. And that's presented by Daniel Say. He's a living history reenactor and museum educator. Now, before we begin, uh, just one technological aspect I'd like to bring up. Uh, I recommend that you switch into speaker view rather than uh, gallery view. Usually there is an icon in the upper right hand corner which can toggle between the two. Speaker view will be uh, a lot uh, easier to, to see the entire screen. Uh, so we do recommend that you switch into that view. Uh, there is also a Q&A button. So you can click on the, the Q&A and just put in any questions that come up during the talk. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, we will go through those and uh, see what kinds of uh, answers that uh, Gregory may have for us. Um, now, I'm going to pass things off to our moderator. Stephen Elliott was our presenter for, from two weeks ago. He was gracious enough to be our moderator for this event. And so I will pass things off to Stephen. All right, uh, thanks a lot, Justin. Uh, it's good to be back here with everyone at uh, Valley Forge. Um, tonight, I have the honor of introducing our speaker. Uh, and after his presentation is over, uh, it will be up to me to moderate the Q&A session. Uh, so as Justin said, please put your questions in the Q&A box um, in Zoom, and I will do my best to extrapolate your questions and relay them to Dr. Irwin. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for tonight. Professor Gregory J.W. Irwin is a military historian with the Department of History at Temple University. His work spans the American War of Independence through World War II. Irwin earned his PhD at the University of Notre Dame and has so far authored nine books as well as numerous articles and essays. While at Temple, he has directed nearly 20 dissertations to completion, helping to launch the careers of many promising young scholars, including yours truly. He has received multiple awards and fellowships, most recently from such prestigious institutions as the William L. Clemens Library, the Richard H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies, and the Society of the Cincinnati, among many, many others. Irwin is a past president of the Society for Military History, a fellow in both the Company of Military Historians and the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, and a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute Center for the Study of America and the West. Lastly, he is the general editor of the Campaigns and Commanders series from the University of Oklahoma Press, where he has shepherded the publication of over 70 books, including several award-winning works on the American War of Independence. A quite accomplished career indeed. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Irwin tonight. There we go. Um, thank you, Stephen, for that, uh, that kind introduction and, and my thanks to the uh, Valley Forge Park uh, uh, folks uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak uh, this evening. Uh, I hope that uh, those of you who uh, decided to forego a pleasant evening outdoors will find uh, at least some of what follows uh, uh, diverting and perhaps uh, a fresh perspective on the end story of the American uh, war of independence. 
uh, being a university professor, I have a PowerPoint. Bring that up. And uh, we can commence. <clears throat> On October 25th, 1781, just six days after General George Washington forced the surrender of a British army at Yorktown, Virginia, he issued an order to his troops that has been scrupulously ignored by historians of the American Revolution. Washington directed his officers and persons of every denomination concerned to apprehend the many Negroes and mulattoes, as he called them, found in and around Yorktown and consigned them to guard posts on either side of the York River. Their free blacks would be separated from runaway slaves who had sought freedom with the British and steps taken to return the latter to their masters. In other words, Washington chose the moment he achieved the victory that guaranteed American independence to convert his Continentals into an army of slave catchers. This is not how Americans like to remember Yorktown. We prefer the vision President Ronald Reagan articulated during the bicentennial of that celebrated turning point 40 years ago. Reagan described Yorktown to a crowd of 60,000 as, quote, a victory for the right of self-determination. It was and is the affirmation that freedom will eventually triumph over tyranny. While white patriots of Washington's day would have embraced Reagan's message, most African-Americans who comprised one fifth of the young republic's population in 1781 would have seen Yorktown's true legacy as the preservation of slavery. Most Americans consume their history in the form of feel good, uh, feel good uh, uh, myths uh, calculated to reinforce pride in their country. While there's nothing wrong with patriotism, history's true purpose is to help us understand the world as it is complete with uh, uncomfortable truths and not just uh, justify uh, cherished assumptions. Uh, if I was uh, giving this talk as a lecture to my students at, at Temple University, I, I would say to them, as future historians yourselves, it is essential that you view the past and the present with eyes unclouded by ideological bias. Our contemporaries and, and generations unborn will rely on you for realistic assessments of the past so they can better gauge society's strengths and weaknesses and devise effective means to cure the latter. And that's my intent in, in tackling this topic. Feel good history though is especially rife among accounts of the American Revolution because the revolution functions as our country's founding myth. As far as the Yorktown campaign goes, American scholars focus so much on lauding Washington's brilliant generalship that they miss how close the British came to subduing Virginia. They also ignore the dark side to Washington's triumph, which crushed the hopes for freedom entertained by so many Virginia Blacks. Let's step back and take a look at the broad picture uh, and the nature of the War of Independence. One reason why the British lost the Revolutionary War is that they took too long to fathom the nature of that conflict. George III and his advisors initially regarded the rebellion as a plot hatched by unprincipled demagogues who deluded the riffraff of the 13 colonies into overthrowing lawful government. The British sincerely believed that most decent Americans remained loyal to their king. A stern show of force would discredit rebel leaders and frighten their fickle followers into submitting to royal rule. Mindful that unrestrained barbarism could cost the crown potential supporters, British commanders tried to restrain the levels of violence that they unleashed on their American cousins. The British set the basic pattern uh, for the War of Independence during the 1776 campaign in New York and New Jersey. General William Howe decided to draw George Washington's nascent Continental Army into battle by seizing New York City. Howe deftly defeated Washington, occupied New York, established a network of outlying outposts, and then waited for the rebel cause to fall apart. He waited in vain. 
Washington's beaten forces simply retired beyond easy reach, rebuilt their ranks, and then took positions that threatened the enemy's smaller and more isolated outposts with sudden, sudden capture. At the same time, militiamen harassed British garrisons and foraging parties, giving the occupiers no rest. Forced to concentrate to avoid defeat in detail, the British ended up living under virtual siege in a few major towns. With the rebels controlling most of the countryside, loyalists could not rise, uh, could not rise in decisive numbers. Any Tory who openly declared for the king risked losing his property, uh, being imprisoned, and possibly put to death. Rather than brave such perils, many loyalists uh, 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 adopted a wait and see attitude. If the king's regulars were, were victorious, loyal subjects would lose nothing by their silence while the issue hung in the balance. But without American help, the British did not have enough boots on the ground to occupy much territory. And if they couldn't occupy uh, or reoccupy the rebellious colonies, uh, what, what use uh, were, were the armies? that they sent to North America. It was, it was a no-win situation. To break the stalemate that came to characterize the American war, royal commanders seized more cities, which only gained them additional worthless real estate. When the British army tried to divide the colonies by marching down the Hudson in 1777, it met with defeat and surrender at Saratoga. That stunning reverse brought France into the war on the side of the United States, and Spain and the Netherlands soon followed suit. Britain now faced a world war, forcing it to redeploy its limited resources as it struggled to hold a far-flung empire, one that extended around the world and back to India. Assured that vast numbers of loyalists inhabited the South, the British shifted their operations to Georgia and the Carolinas. In May 1780, General Sir Henry Clinton, the commander in chief of His Majesty's forces in North America, uh, captured uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and more than 6,000 Patriot troops cornered in the doomed port. Clinton soon returned to his main base at New York City, leaving Lieutenant General Charles, Second Earl Cornwallis, and 8,000 regulars to establish uh, British rule in the Carolinas. Cornwallis was a robust 41 years of age and enjoyed a reputation as one of the king's ablest and most aggressive generals. Uh, Clinton's predecessor, uh, Sir William Howe as commander in chief had put a lot of trust in Cornwallis. At first, getting back to the situation in South Carolina, uh, at first, Cornwallis's mission in the Carolinas seemed easy. The elimination of an entire continental army at Charleston left local patriots demoralized and vulnerable. As the British advanced inland, the rebels either fled or switched their allegiance to the crown. Magnanimous in victory, Cornwallis permitted them to take an oath of loyalty and join his loyalist militia. Then in the summer of 1780, uh, the Continental Congress sent a new army to reclaim South Carolina. Though badly outnumbered, Cornwallis crushed this threat at the uh, Battle of uh, Camden on August 16th, 1780, but this triumph left a bittersweet taste. At the approach of the Continental troops, South Carolina's supposedly repentant rebels turned on the British. Whole units of loyal militia, or supposedly loyal militia, took the arms and equipment drawn from royal magazines and defected to the guerrilla bands massing in the swamps outside Charleston. Excuse me. Later in the year, Cornwallis confronted a second American army under Major General Nathaniel Green, Washington's favorite lieutenant. Keeping just beyond reach, Green goaded Cornwallis into uh, conducting a ruinous midwinter pursuit across barren North Carolina. Green led the Earl on a grueling chase for nearly two months, finally turning to fight at uh, Guilford, Guilford Courthouse, Guilford Courthouse up there near the Virginia, near the Virginia 
border. Uh, that battle occurred on March 15th, 1781. Green's forces outnumbered the British two to one, but Cornwallis put his trust in the prowess of the British regular and he prevailed once more. Nevertheless, he failed to destroy Green's army while coming uncomfortably close to destroying his own. More than a quarter of the 1900 Redcoats, Hessians, and Loyalists that entered the fray fell killed or wounded. The strains of the campaign sickened another 436 of Cornwallis's troops, leaving them unfit for duty. Before Cornwallis's ailing army could recover, Green marched on South Carolina. This time, however, Cornwallis did not oblige Green with another game of cat and mouse. So Cornwallis didn't go chasing after Green when Green headed south into, into, into South Carolina. Years of hard campaigning in America had finally exposed the flaws in Britain's fundamental strategy. For the rest of that spring and well into the summer, Cornwallis would experiment with a new approach for subduing the rebels. Cornwallis's most significant realization was that most Southern loyalists could not be trusted. Our experience has shown that their numbers are not so great as has been represented, he wrote from North Carolina, and that their friendship was only passive. The Crown's American supporters made big promises, but they usually deserted the royal cause at the first sign of trouble. As for the troublesome Green, the Earl had decided that there were less expensive ways to deal with rebel armies than attacking them directly. Cornwallis would attempt to counter the threat to the Carolinas by striking at Virginia, the American general's logistical base. Virginia at that time was the largest, most populous and richest of the rebellious colonies or, or United States. Uh, it's tobacco essential to the survival of America's staggering economy. With Charleston in British hands, Virginia became the mainstay of the rebel war effort in the South. It provided the men and materiel that Green needed to keep his army in the field. If Virginia could be knocked out of the war, perhaps the whole rebel confederation might collapse. These considerations prompted Cornwallis to write on April 18th, 1781. So this is a month after Guilford Courthouse and Cornwallis wrote, if therefore it should appear to be the interest of Great Britain to maintain what she already possesses and to push the war in the Southern provinces, I take the liberty of giving it as my opinion that a serious attempt upon Virginia would be the most solid plan because successful operations might not only be attended with important consequences there, but would tend to the security of South Carolina and ultimately to the submission of North Carolina. Virginia seemed to invite invasion in 1781. Six years of war had left its people weary and sick of sacrifice. Almost all their continental regiments had been captured at Charleston, which left only a few half-trained regulars to defend the state. In addition, large drafts of the Virginia militia had trekked far from home to fight under Green. Those who survived the arduous campaigns in the Carolinas harbored no desire to face Cornwallis's redcoats again. Nature alone favored the Earl's designs. Chesapeake Bay, uh, the entrance of which we can see here where the arrow is dancing. Chesapeake Bay with its network of great tidal rivers and other navigable streams provided the watery highway responsible for Virginia's prosperity. Um, tobacco was shipped out through Chesapeake Bay and then goods bought by Euro from European merchants before the war British merchants were, were shipped in. Um, the Chesapeake also offered the British a ready-made invasion route with a twisting 8,000 mile shoreline impossible to defend. As long as the Royal Navy ruled the waves, there was hardly anything of importance in Virginia east of the Blue Ridge Mountains that could not be flattened by British broadsides or menaced by landing parties. With these facts in mind, Lord Cornwallis marched north for the Old Dominion on April 25th, 1781. By May 20th, he had reached Petersburg near the center of Virginia, where he rendezvoused with a small British army commanded by Brigadier General Benedict Arnold. Yes, uh, you've got that right, Benedict Arnold. Arnold 
the notorious American traitor um, had uh, become a British Brigadier General. And uh, he was sent on his first mission to open operations in Virginia by raiding up the James River in January 1781. And his quick capture of Richmond I like to say that the Connecticut born uh, Arnold was the first Yankee general to capture Richmond, Virginia. His quick capture of Richmond demonstrated the old Dominion's vulnerability to amphibious operations. Major General William Phillips joined Arnold a few months later with 2,000 reinforcements and assumed command of the combined force only to die of typhoid fever at Petersburg a week before Cornwallis's arrival. After Cornwallis absorbed Arnold's expedition and other reinforcements, he had 8,000 seasoned regulars at his disposal, and he proceeded to subject Virginia to the ravages of war. Two weeks after this, this junction uh, between Cornwallis and Arnold, uh, Virginian George Mason, a gentleman lawyer uh, and a leading Virginia rebel, a uh, friend and neighbor of George Washington, voiced his despair, and I quote Mason, our affairs have been for some time growing from bad to worse. The enemy's fleet commands our rivers and puts it in their power to remove their troops from place to place when and where they please without opposition so that we no sooner collect a force sufficient to counteract them in one part of the country, but they shift to another, ravaging, plundering, destroying everything before them. For the next four months, Cornwallis terrorized Virginia patriots with a new brand of war. He replaced the mistaken assumptions that had hobbled the king's forces for the past six years with a simple but brutal strategy that shook Virginia's political foundations. Less than a month after Cornwallis entered the Old Dominion, Richard Henry Lee, who had helped lead Americans to espouse independence in 1776, sounded like a defeatist. We shall receive all the injury before aid is sent to us. What will become of these parts, heaven knows. We are in the power of the enemy. To that gloomy assessment, Lee added, Cornwallis is the scourge, and a severe one he is. The doings of more than a year in the South are undoing very fast, whilst they rush to throw ruin into the other parts. Cornwallis broke most dramatically with the past by ceasing to bank on loyalist aid. He no longer wasted his time courting unreliable allies. All they asked of white Virginians claiming fidelity to George III was that they keep out of his way. Unlike other British commanders, Cornwallis kept his army on the move almost constantly. From the experience I have had, the Earl reflected, and the dangers I have undergone, one maxim appears to me to be absolutely necessary for the safe and honorable conduct of this war, which is that we should have as few posts as possible and that wherever the King's troops are, they should be in respectable force. Cornwallis kept the rebels off balance with swift, frequent marches, bewildering his foes by moving at night and making them feel they possessed few safe places to rally or stockpile arms. Cornwallis also ensured Virginia civilians paid for their rebellious sympathies by exposing them to the horrors of war. If Virginians wanted to defy royal authority, they would not go unpunished. Cornwallis set his far-ranging army to destroying anything useful to the Patriot war effort, including private property. Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton, the commander of Cornwallis's cavalry, boasted that he would carry the sword and fire through the land. Everywhere Cornwallis's soldiers went, they promised to retaliate against the homes and persons of any Virginians in arms against the king. The property of those who figured prominently in the rebellion suffered thorough destruction. This was how Thomas Jefferson, then Virginia's governor, described what Cornwallis did to his estate at Elk Hill. He destroyed all my growing crops of corn and tobacco. He burned all my bonds containing the same articles of the last year, having first taken what corn he wanted. He used all my stocks of cattle, sheep, and hogs for the sustenance of his army and carried off all the horses capable of service. Of those too young for service, he cut the throats and he built all the fences on the plantation so as to leave it an absolute waste. While threatening Virginia rebels with instant impoverishment, Cornwallis insulated his troops from the worst effects of guerrilla warfare by increasing their mobility. Most of Cornwallis's British regiments had been campaigning in North America since 1775 and 1776. Extensive combat experience left these regulars equally adept at the formal European tactics of the day and the open order woodland skirmishing favored by rebel irregulars. 
Among the most valuable units serving with Cornwallis were two green-coated Loyalist Corps, the British Legion and the Queen's Rangers. The British Legion's like dragoons followed a ruthless young Englishman named Bannister Tarleton, arguably the most talented cavalryman of the war. As for the Queen's Rangers, 40% of its personnel were horse soldiers, hussars, and light dragoons, while the rest were superbly conditioned light infantry. The Queen's Rangers served under another energetic young English officer, Lieutenant John Graves Simcoe. An avid practitioner of partisan warfare, Simcoe excelled at ambushing his adversaries. By combining the cavalry from the British Legion and the Queen's Rangers, Cornwallis could count on the services of roughly 500 hussars and light dragoons, the largest number of horsemen ever assembled by the British during the war in the South. The size of the Earl's cavalry had a particularly intimidating effect on the Virginia militia. As the Marquis de Lafayette, the young French general commanding the Continental Forces charged with Virginia's defense complained to George Washington, was I to fight a battle I'll be cut to pieces, the militia dispersed and the arms lost. Was I to decline fighting, the country would think herself given up. I am therefore determined to skirmish, but not to engage too far and particularly to take care against their immense and excellent body of horse whom the militia fears like they would so many beasts. Even as Lafayette wrote these words, however, Cornwallis took steps that prevented the rebels from impeding the progress of British forces in Virginia. Since the late 17th century, the favorite hobbies of Virginia's gentry were breeding and racing fine horses. Nearly every plantation contained a stable full of thoroughbreds. When Cornwallis invaded Virginia, he seized these spirited chargers for his own use. With this inexhaustible supply of remounts, the Earl's 500 light dragoons and hussars could travel 30 to 70 miles a day, which greatly increased the range and unsettling impact of their raids. Cornwallis also put 700 to 800 of his infantrymen on horseback, more than doubling his mounted strength. In this way, Cornwallis created a British army that could outrun its rebel opponents for the first time in the American Revolution. To avoid encirclement or surprise by the Earl's larger and faster forces, Lafayette kept at least 20 to 30 miles away from the British. At that distance, he could neither oppose nor harass the Redcoats. The British have so many dragoons, Lafayette informed Governor Jefferson, that it becomes nearly impossible to stop or reconnoiter their movements. All through the spring and summer of 1781, Cornwallis found himself free to go where he wanted. He could ravage the old dominion unchecked by Lafayette. The fact is, Richard Henry Lee related, the enemy by a quick collection of their force and by rapid movements are now in the center of Virginia with an army of regular infantry greater than that of the compounded regulars and militia commanded by the Marquis de Lafayette and with five or 600 excellent cavalry. This country is in the moment of its greatest danger abandoned to the arts and arms of the enemy. Although Cornwallis uh, sought to subdue Virginia by shaking its civilian population, he did not allow his army to degenerate into a mob of freebooters. His war on private property proceeded under strict supervision. From Cole's plantation, the Earl admonished his army on June 5th, 1781, all private foraging is again forbid and the outposts are not to suffer any foraging party to pass without a commissioned officer, meaning without supervision. Those soldiers defying the Earl's efforts to maintain discipline risked prompt and merciless punishment. On June 2nd, Lieutenant Colonel Simcoe informed Cornwallis that two light dragoons from the Queen's Rangers had raped and robbed a woman named Jane Dickinson. The Earl had them executed the following day. Despite these gestures, Cornwallis most unnerved white Virginians by liberating their black slaves. Virginia's 200,000 bondmen made up 40% of the state's population. Had Cornwallis been permitted to follow his own instincts, these exploited masses might have tipped the balance in favor of his attempted conquest of the Old Dominion. Now, today's US history textbooks take care to mention those African-Americans who supported the Patriot cause. As historian David Waldstreicher reminds us, however, 
One of the less well-known facts about the Revolutionary War is that African-Americans fought on both sides, primarily with their own freedom in mind. Many blacks, harbor, harbor, <clears throat> many blacks harbored no loyalty to a movement that promised life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness solely to white adult males. Why should they? Of the 500,000 blacks who inhabited the 13 colonies during the War of Independence, tens of thousands flocked to the king's forces. The Reverend Henry Muhlenberg, a, a Lutheran minister who worked near Philadelphia, confided to his diary that blacks secretly wished that the British army might win, for then all Negro slaves will gain their freedom. This became most evident to the British when they invaded the South, where the overwhelming number of slaves resided. Colonel Tarleton reported that all the Negroes, men, women, and children, upon the approach of any detachment of the King's troops, thought themselves absolved from all respect to their American masters and entirely released from servitude. Influenced by this idea, they quitted the plantations and followed the army. As long as the British sought to win the allegiance of white Americans, they discouraged this black exodus. The Redcoats even returned runaways to masters who were repeatedly loyal or neutral. By the time Cornwallis entered Virginia, however, he no longer worried about slave owners' feelings and he permitted black runaways to tag along with his soldiers. The response of Virginia's blacks astounded both the patriots and the British. The damage sustained by individuals on this occasion is inconceivable, testified Dr. Robert Hunneman, a physician in Hanover County, especially in Negroes. The infatuation of these poor creatures was amazing. They flocked to the enemy from all quarters, even from very remote parts. Many gentlemen lost 30, 40, 50, 60, or 70 Negroes beside their stocks of cattle, sheep, and horses. Some plantations were entirely cleared and not a single Negro remained. Several endeavored to bring their Negroes up the country and some succeeded, but from others, the slaves went off by the way and went to the enemy. Other prominent Virginians told similar stories. Cornwallis's soldiers actively encouraged Virginia slaves to follow them. Dr. Hunneman, who refused to flee his home at the Earl's approach, observed the enemy's recruitment practices. Wherever they had an opportunity, Honeyman confided to his journal, the soldiers and inferior officers enticed and flattered the Negroes and prevailed on vast numbers to go along with them, but did not compel any. Captain Johann Ewald, the commander of a Hessian Jaeger detachment, these were uh, Hessian uh, riflemen uh, in green coats. Uh, Captain Ewald, uh, who was commanding a Hessian Jaeger detachment with Cornwallis, explained his comrades' passion for liberating slaves. These people were given their freedom by the army because it was actually taught this would punish the rich, rebellious-minded inhabitants of Virginia. By the middle of June, 1781, thousands of runaway slaves were with Cornwallis's army. How all this appeared to the British can be glimpsed from Captain Ewell's diary. Every officer had four to six horses and three or four Negroes, as well as one or two Negresses for cook and maid. Every soldier's woman was mounted and also had a Negro and und Negress on horseback for her servants. Each squad had one or two horses or the Negroes and every non-commissioned officer had two horses and one Negro. Yes, indeed, I can testify that every soldier had his Negro who carried his provisions and bundles. This multitude always hunted at a gallop and behind the baggage follow, followed well over 4,000 Negroes of both sexes and all ages. Any place this horde approached was eaten clean, like an acre invaded by a swarm of locusts. Virginia's fugitive slaves did more than serve the Earl's soldiers as porters and body servants. The Blacks also contributed substantially to Cornwallis's new style of warfare. By encouraging slaves to leave their masters, Cornwallis threatened Virginia with economic ruin. Slaves represented the currency whereby the Tidewater planters calculated their wealth. Slaves also provided the cheap labor undergirding the Old Dominion's agrarian prosperity. Thus, Cornwallis robbed Virginia of the very means of production required to replace 
the vital resources his troops uh, destroyed. The addition of thousands of African Americans to the British forces vastly augmented Cornwallis's ability to ravage the countryside. <clears throat> Dr. Honeyman of Hanover County composed this vivid picture of one of Cornwallis's abandoned campsites. The day after the enemy left Mrs. Nicholas's plantation, I went over to her house where I saw the devastation caused by the enemies encamping there. The fences were pulled down and much of them burnt. Many cattle, hogs, sheep, and poultry of all sorts killed. 150 barrels of corn eat up or wasted. And the offal of the cattle, etc., with dead horses and pieces of flesh, all in a putri putrefying state, scattered over the plantation. Virginia's fugitive slaves also advanced Cornwallis's campaign in other ways. Runaways sometimes acted as spies and guides for the British. The Blacks frequently showed their new friends where fleeing masters had hidden their valuables and livestock. In fact, the African-Americans delivered so many horses to Cornwallis that Lafayette exclaimed, nothing but a treaty of alliance with the Negroes could find out the good horses. And it is by those means that the enemy have got a formidable cavalry. At other times, the Blacks provided manual labor for the British Army, a corps of what uh, the British Army called Negro pioneers or military laborers buried the offal from butchered cattle after Cornwallis's troops received issues of fresh meat, thus eliminating a nauseating stench and also a health hazard. The Army's Blacks pulled double duty as stevedores uh, whenever Cornwallis used ships to transport soldiers, equipment, and supplies. The extensive earthworks the British erected first at Portsmouth and then at Yorktown were built largely by black muscle. Finally, the defection of so many slaves spread the fear of servile revolt, the white South's most dreaded nightmare, far and wide throughout Virginia. Although Cornwallis benefited from the specter of Black Rebellion, he did not intend to unleash a racial reign of terror. The Earl posted numerous regulations aimed at ensuring orderly conduct among slaves seeking his protection. To restore his army's proper military appearance and free his columns of unnecessary encumbrances, Cornwallis restricted the number of horses and Blacks employed by his officers. Cornwallis's headquarters frequently reminded unit commanders to purge their ranks of surplus forces and blacks. Some of Cornwallis's officers sharing his sense of military decorum conscientiously enforced their commander's orders. On June 4th, one regimental commander warned his redcoats, any man found guilty of sending the Negroes of the regiment, plundering or marauding the smallest article from the houses of the inhabitants will be severely punished. Cornwallis kept his black camp followers under control and prevented their eroding his troops discipline and the army's ability to respond to threats. Although military expedients governed the Earl's treatment of Virginia slaves, he did betray a glimmer of sympathy for the runaways. In late July, 1781, Thomas Nelson, uh, Jefferson's successor as Virginia's governor, wrote Cornwallis to ask if there were any circumstances under which the state citizens might reclaim their runaway property. The Earl replied with the de facto emancipation proclamation, and I quote, being desirous to grant any indulgence to individuals that I think consistent with my public duty, any proprietor not in arms against us, or holding an office of trust under the authority of Congress, and willing to give his parole that he will not in future act against his majesty's interest, will be indulged with permission to search the camp for his Negroes and take them if they are willing to go with him. By the summer of 1781, Lord Cornwallis's new strategy of conquest bore a strong resemblance to the hard war policies that another invading army would adopt to pacify the American South eight decades later. Cornwallis essentially taught the Old Dominion the same lessons that Major Generals William Tecumseh Sherman and Philip Henry Sheridan would administer to the Confederacy during the latter part of the American Civil War. Cornwallis's version of hard war 
was steadily forcing Virginia to its knees. The startling mobility of the Earl's army denied local continental forces the opportunity to engage in either conventional or guerrilla warfare. Cornwallis's policy of property despoliation also neutralized Virginia's last remaining line of defense, the, the militia. The strength and speed of British forces terrified Virginia's citizen soldiers. Militiamen grew reluctant to take up arms, lest they provoke the Redcoats into destroying their homes. They also hesitated to leave their families alone with their slaves, lest uh, the latter rebel. In addition, Thomas Jefferson and many other well-known Virginians, such as Richard Henry Lee, Edmund Pendleton, and George Mason, fled before the British, depriving the Patriot cause of some of its best political leadership. Denied relief by an impotent state government, the Continental Congress, or America's French allies, Virginians began to consider making a separate peace with Great Britain. The inhabitants of Norfolk, Princess Anne, and Nansmont counties placed themselves under British protection. The men of Montgomery, Bedford, and Prince Edward counties ignored summons from militia duty. When state officials tried to raise the militia in Accomack, Northampton, and Lancaster counties, they encountered armed mobs. Farmers living around the British base at Portsmouth started trading with the enemy, sometimes bringing the Redcoats military intelligence. Defeatist sentiment reached such dangerous levels that Richard Henry Lee recommended that General Washington return to Virginia with his troops and assume dictatorial powers until the crisis passed. Fortunately for the rebels, British efforts to interdict General Greene's Virginia lifeline were short-lived. Interference from above brought a premature close to Cornwallis's campaign to knock the state out of the war. Cornwallis had entered Virginia without prior permission from his immediate superior, Sir Henry Clinton, who damned that move as very contrary to my wishes and intentions. In the middle of the summer, Clinton ordered Cornwallis to retire to the coast, set up a naval base, and send 2,000 troops back to New York. An exasperated Cornwallis began entrenching at Yorktown on August 2nd, 1781. Now fate turned against the British. At the end of, of August, a French fleet appeared off Chesapeake Bay, uh, denying Cornwallis access to the sea. Seizing this opportunity, Washington pulled out of his lines around New York uh, and uh, slipped down to Virginia with a strong Franco-American army. By September 28, 1781, Cornwallis and his 6,000 weary regulars found themselves besieged by nearly 17,000 Americans and uh, Frenchmen. Cornwallis knew he was in a tight spot. Although he sympathized with the black runaways under his protection, he was the king's servant first. Hoping to stretch his army's provisions until Clinton arrived with a relief expedition, the Earl ordered all but 2,000 of the slaves sheltering at Yorktown expelled from British lines. Besides being terrified at the thought of returning to their vengeful masters, many of the cast off blacks were seriously ill. They had contracted smallpox in the Earl's camps. Dogged by despair and weakened by disease, hundreds of runaways simply lay down in the no man's land between the opposing trenches where they died of exposure, illness, and starvation. The remainder took shelter in the woods around Yorktown. Many did not live long enough to witness Cornwallis's surrender on October 19, 1781. Of those who survived, some were recaptured and others returned voluntarily to their old homes where they communicated smallpox to slaves who had deigned not to run away. For African-Americans, the British invasions of Virginia in 1781 set off a surge of hope that ended in tragedy. Those who flocked to Cornwallis registered their hatred for chattel slavery and their desire for liberty, the primordial American urge, a desire so great, they braved the dangers of war to realize it. For a brief moment, they found freedom under the shelter of a major power whose interests coincided with their own. When the war turned against the British, however, they ended up abandoning their black allies. Thank you.
and leaving intact an institution that, of course, would uh, plunge America into uh, an orgy of, of mass violence and near self-destruction 80 years later. All right, Dr. Irwin, thank you for that presentation. Uh, we have several comments that have come in from the audience uh, and questions, and I relay a few of those to you now. Um, first off, um, how did the experiences of enslaved people in the Northern colonies differ from those in the South uh, in terms of, of their kind of intersection with military operations. Um, do we see black folk in the North also joining up with the Redcoats? Uh, did the British pursue a different policy uh, regarding African-Americans in the North compared to Cornwallis and Virginia? That's a good question. Um, African-Americans um, in, in the young United States, like subject people elsewhere, such as the Irish, uh, in Indians uh, in the sub subcontinent, they, depending on where they were and what was happening in their locality at any specific time, they often made the best bargain they could uh, with, with, uh, with those circumstances in, uh, you know, if they, they couldn't be free, then uh, at least to enhance their chances for survival. And uh, in, in the North, there were fewer slaves than there were in the South, but, but every state had slavery when the revolution began. And there were some, some slaves uh, who, who saw the, the war as uh, their opportunity to be free. Uh, the, the slave grapevine that uh, John Adams and uh, other patriots spoke about communicated the sense that if, if uh, as things were brewing up, if there was a rebellion, the British would free slaves to punish rebellious masters. And so some blacks wanted to take advantage of that. Uh, the uh, Lutheran minister that I, that I quoted, uh, Muhlenberg, uh, he was working outside Philadelphia and, and he got this, 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 this report that blacks wanted the British to win from two black servants that were accompanying a, a white family that were fleeing as the British were about to, to um, occupy Philadelphia. But there were some blacks uh, in the North who, uh, for one reason or another, uh, thought that their opportunities uh, 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 would be uh, more favorable by siding with, uh, with the rebellion. Um, uh, you know, there are at least 5,000 that we know of. Uh, it's an estimate of uh, African-Americans who served in the Continental Army. There may have, may have been more because rosters didn't always indicate uh, a soldier's race. And John Smith could be a white guy or he could be a black guy. You know, it's, but, but we know that there were a significant number of blacks who uh, for a variety of reasons uh, supported the revolution. Uh, so, um, uh, but there were others, you know, who, there, there was a, a, uh, a, a African-American escaped slave named Ty who uh, gathered a band of, of white and black loyalists in New Jersey and, and conducted a fairly uh, effective or at least terrifying uh, guerrilla war for a while in the middle of, of that state. So, you know, it's, as I say, it varied. Uh, during the siege of, 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 of Charleston, uh, John Graves Simcoe commanded the, the, the Loyalist Queens Rangers, uh, captured three black servants who were attached to a Continental Artillery unit. They were dressed in the unit's uniform and he absorbed them into, into the Queens Rangers. <laughs> it looked like their side was losing and so they, they decided to side with the, with the British. Uh, so, you know, it's, you could find all kinds of interesting cases uh, of people who were, you know, served both both sides during that time. But large numbers of slaves, uh, especially in the South, fled to the British when it, when it looked like the British had the upper hand, uh, especially after the fall of Charleston. And again, when the British hit Virginia with a significant force, and and uh, the Patriots didn't seem able to cope with them. And. Uh, you touched on this in, in your response here, but uh, if, if you have anything else to add, uh, there were questions about those black soldiers who did serve in the Continental Army. Uh, and I think you just gave us a, a figure for, for what we think that might have been. Um, so 
can you maybe comment on on the similarities or differences in motivations where we have some escaped enslaved people winding up with the redcoats and and others winding up with the continental army um you know fighting on opposite sides of the conflict well it's you know you have the same thing with white americans uh there's been an excellent book published uh, over the last couple of years by uh, Judith Van Buskirk, uh, Standing in the Wrong Light, which deals with uh, the African-American soldier during the revolution. And one, one thing about her book uh, that makes it stand out is that she got into the pension records uh, you know, of Revolutionary War uh, um, uh, veterans uh, that, uh, and, uh, that were collected in the 1820s, early 1830s. And to apply for a pension, you had to provide a, a narrative uh, saying where you were enlisted and with whom you served, et cetera. And so you know, they'll, they'll, you'll see sometimes, you know, uh, uh, in addition to giving those basic facts to try to document, yes, I really was a soldier, there'll be you know, statements of patriotism and pride and that I had to serve under Washington or you know, to be, be at this victory or to endure this defeat. Um, but Judy uh, feels that the most important things about these pension applications is that these men wanted it to be remembered that they uh, were part of the fight for independence. They took great pride in that uh, because you know, they felt that justified, that entitled them and, and their children to a certain amount of respect that was being withdrawn from them uh, at that point in American history. And they fought very hard Sometimes they were turned down. They'd come back with, with more affidavits and, and you know, more evidence uh, to get those pensions, to get uh, official recognition from the U.S. government that they helped to create the U.S. government. So um, um, it says something about, about self-interest, but also that, no, we're Americans too. You know, they, 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 they felt that they were part of this enterprise that they got it started, and I think and they took due pride in that. Um, in your presentation, you, you talked about the, the sort of unfortunate circumstances that, that the African Americans that have to kind of flee Yorktown during the siege wind up in. Um, for Black Americans that wound up in New York City in, in British lines and, and when the war comes to an end there, um, can you comment at all on, on their post-war experiences in, in Canada or elsewhere in the British Empire? Some of the people who were at Yorktown escaped and ended up getting back to New York. Uh, the first word that Sir Henry Clinton got of, of the fall of Yorktown, he tried to organize a relief expedition with a, a British fleet and he had troops on these, these men of war. And they got to, you know, just to the Virginia Capes, the entrance to Chesapeake Bay. And according to one, uh, one report in the Clinton papers, they ran into a four, uh, four oared boat that uh, was manned by two black men and two white men who, when they saw that Cornwallis was getting ready to surrender, two black guys didn't want to go back to slavery. So somehow they, they sneaked uh, uh, down the York River past the French Navy. I mean, they must have been hugging cane breaks and things during the day and, and traveling at night. And then get out into, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to the mouth of Chesapeake Bay, but the water is pretty rough. You're going into open ocean. Uh, so uh, um, they, you know, the, the, uh, they ended up in New York. But to, to get back to the question, um, the United, young United States, uh, because you know it was a shaky coalition uh, of states where slavery was a strong economic interest, and states where it wasn't. In fact, there were some like Massachusetts and Pennsylvania. Or, deciding this doesn't really square with, with what we profess about all men create, being created equal. We, we, we need to uh, dismantle slavery, but, but still in the South, there was a strong economic interest. And so the Treaty of Paris, which, which uh, brought the war to a close, uh, contained a clause that obligated the British to return runaway slaves. And the British commander in New York, uh, he replaced Clinton following the Yorktown disaster, Sir Guy Carleton, uh, began uh, making a list of these people. Uh, the list became what became known as the Book of Negroes, what their names were, where, where they escaped from, what the names of their masters were, et cetera. But when the time came, or as the time approached to turn them over to Washington, Washington was the system, you've got to, you've got to 
uh, you know, you've got to meet your obligation. This is this is a treaty. It's binding on your country. Carlton said, I can't do it. And shipped, the, shipped them to Nova Scotia, <laughs> shipped them to Canada. About 3,000 people are listed in the book uh, of Negroes. Um, after Yorktown fell, um, a number of fast talking runaways um, offered their services to officers in the French army and got taken on as servants, which caused something of a minor diplomatic uh, uh, rift between the United States and its much more powerful ally, France. And there's all kinds of correspondence coming out of Virginia, uh, going to Congress and between Congress and the French court. Uh, dealing with uh, dealing with this problem, uh, it wasn't really resolved with the satisfaction of American slave owners, but there these there were none of these people who who found ways to to get to get away to get to get to get clear, but you know a large number of them uh, because of uh, the smallpox epidemic that they claimed uh, lots of people during the revolution, not just uh, runaway slaves. Uh, a lot of them paid for their for their. Uh, their, 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 their bid for freedom with their lives. So did, did I answer that question? Um, yeah, and, and there was a, a more specific question tied to, to the anecdote you related about folks escaping in a boat. Um, someone wanted to know if you were familiar at all with the history of the sloop of war Bonetta, which sailed from New York oh, yeah. after the surrender. Yeah, that, that, that was a, as part of the, the capitulation agreement, uh, uh, Cornwallis was permitted to send the Bonetta to New York with his dispatches, and it would not be searched. So uh, there were a number of, of, of soldiers in the Queen's Rangers, and also in the British Legion who were deserters from the Continental Army, uh, and they crammed them aboard so they wouldn't be, you know, uh, executed uh, for treason. And a number of blacks got aboard too. I mean, that's this anecdotal. Evidence, but people said, you know, they just, I don't know how many blacks were, were on the Bonetta, but I, you know, I, I don't think there was much, uh, well, you, you probably, people were lucky if they were sleeping on the floor or, or sleeping sitting up, especially in the holds of that ship. But yeah, yeah, and, uh, the Bonetta uh, figures prominently in, in both the, the formal um, documentation pertaining to the British surrender and then. It, Almost anybody who was there mentioned the Bonetta and, and you know, kind of wink, wink. <laughs> they were just using it to, to, to get people uh, away from the, the clutches of our American, our American uh, uh, conquerors. Um, so there's been a lot of scholarship on maroon communities, these, these sort of free black communities and in, in kind of rough terrain and remote areas. Um, did you encounter anything in your research about kind of maroon communities of the, the Chesapeake region or, or the South? In the Great Dismal Swamp to the west of, of Portsmouth uh, on the Virginia, North Carolina border, there, there were a good number of, uh, of runaway slaves, some of them armed, who settled in that area and then there were expeditions to try to, try to catch them. Um, I don't know if they ever got them all any more than they got all the Seminoles out of the swamps of Florida, but that was that was the biggest maroon community um, uh, relative to my to my story. Okay, uh, and then we have a couple of questions that are, are um, a little bit more tied into British strategy. Um, someone wanted to know if you detect an escalation in confiscations of property and and just sort of property violations and, and plundering and whatnot uh, later in the war? Uh, were the British less likely to pay for their forge in 1781 compared to say 1777? Uh, plundering was a problem among the King's forces starting on the 19th of April, 1775. Even when they were fighting for their lives, trying to get back to Boston with 10,000 Minutemen shooting at them, some of the British troops that were involved in the Lexington Concord raid broke into houses, set fires, carried off stuff. Uh, and uh, this was a major problem. Um, uh, again, when the British uh, drove Washington out of New York and swept across New Jersey, um, there were a lot of atrocities committed, not only uh, crimes against property, but also cases of rape and murder against uh, inhabitants who tried to resist such depredations. 
And uh, these um, atrocities, these depredations helped to set off the, the militia insurgency that made life really tough for the Hessians at Trenton and, and the smaller British garrisons posted throughout the state. Uh, I mean, at Trenton, you couldn't get a dispatch out unless you sent a, I think, a, a, sent with a hundred man escort you know, to get to the next town to get to Princeton. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, this, this backfired in the face of the British uh, again, uh, when Sir William Howe uh, invaded uh, Pennsylvania, came up against Philadelphia, there was widespread pillaging and this, this, this uh, things are so bad uh, that, uh, I mean, Howe ordered issues, uh, issued orders against it, uh, court martialed people, but, you know, trained soldiers were a rare commodity, so he was reluctant to execute people. But, you know, um, the behavior of the troops scandalized um, British officers. One guards officer during the Philadelphia campaign talked about one of his men who cut, cut a woman's uh, finger off to, uh, to uh, get a ring that she had. And he said, you know, if, the, if this army gets back to, to Britain, there are going to be a lot of um, candidates for uh, the hangman and for, and for, uh, for prison. Uh, so, uh, uh, Howe never really finds a way to put a lid on this. And after he leaves, Sir Henry Clinton, who you know criticized almost everything Howe did, he was determined to uh, come up with a policy that would um, uh, you know end practices that really you know the British were not just there to, to conquer; they were there to win hearts and minds. They didn't want to to, to, to station a thirty-two thousand man army permanently in North America. They wanted to. to defeat and discredit the rebels and then you know bring all the Americans back under 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 royal control and the Americans willingly you know would follow British would submit to British rule and they realized this you know this is this is this is not going to we just make an enemy so Clinton picked two bright officers on his staff ill-fated officers John Andre and Patrick Ferguson uh, to drop kind of white papers on how, how do you subsist an army uh, in the interior you know on the coast you can just Pull support, you can pull provisions off a ship when they're in the interior, make sure they get fresh food and stuff like that. I like you to do that without alienating the populace. And they both drew up plans. And you know, it's basically, you know, we got in, we got enforced stronger discipline. Uh, now, you know, no one's allowed to go foraging unless they're under con the control of an officer. Uh, we'll give Americans the opportunity to sell their produce to us and to sell their, uh, to sell livestock, to sell milk, cheese, et cetera. And we will pay them in better currency than they can get from Washington streets. You know, hopefully uh, they'll, they'll, the weight of British gold will help to, to sway them over to our side. So they try to do that, but it's, it's difficult. I mean, we had a bunch of young men running around expending calories uh, in a hostile countryside and they've got guns. Uh, abuses are going to occur. And Cornwallis would try to implement this policy uh, in the South. Uh, but the, the number of times he has to issue orders against plundering indicates that uh, it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a foolproof system. Uh, but at the same time, I, I've found uh, a, a depositions from people, uh, I found depositions in people's papers you know, uh, certificates uh, from British commissary saying the crown owes you so much money for 10, 10 head of cattle, that kind of thing. So uh, the system worked at times, at times it didn't work as well as it, as the British wanted to, but they kept, they kept trying to make, make it work as they realized how problematic uh, terrorizing most of the population would be. And keeping on the uh, topic of British strategy, uh, one of our viewers tonight uh, suggests that the area around Fredericksburg, uh, further north of where most of these operations were occurring, uh, had a, a center of arms production and, and some of the better tobacco uh, that could be found in Virginia. Um, so they would like to know, were any of the British commanders aware that there might be a, a more valuable strategic target to the north and maybe that they missed an opportunity of going after that? Yeah, there was an important ironworks there. Um, and, and Cornwallis did, when he first entered the state, think about uh, going there. In fact, he made it look like he was going there. 
Uh, but that was to throw Lafayette off balance because he pivoted and sent um, a raiding party under Bannister Tarleton, about 170 guys, uh, 120 cavalry, 50 mounted infantry, riding to uh, Charlottesville, where the Virginia Assembly had relocated uh, because Richmond was no longer safe. And he came very close to capturing uh, Washington. He captured some of the legislators, including one from over the mountains from the Kentucky district named Daniel Boone. Uh, and he also sent another column under Simcoe to attack uh, another rebel depot at Point of Fork, which Simcoe uh, succeeded in capturing and, and destroyed a great deal of, uh, of Patriot stores, weapons under repair, things like that. But Cornwallis decided not to, uh, not to uh, go to Fredericksburg uh, for the time being. Uh, he, when he got to Virginia, he, saw, he, he looked through General Phillips, who had died through his dispatches and saw that Sir Henry Clinton wanted him to, uh, after he raided up uh, to uh, Petersburg, uh, that's uh, the operation that cost, uh, cost uh, Phillips his life to, to go back to Portsmouth and uh, make sure it was a secure naval base and, and uh, await further orders. So Cornwallis was, was moving east instead of move, moving further north, waiting to get clarification from Clinton. Send word to Clinton. I'm here, and there are a lot of possibilities here. We could win the war here. Uh, you know, please let me loose. Uh, but Clinton, Clinton then began saying, "No, I want you to send troops to New York because the Americans and French are going to attack me here. No, I want you to send troops up up the Chesapeake. And we're going to raid Philadelphia because they've got a lot of stores there. Then we're going to go to Baltimore because we have a lot of friends there. I want to establish a line across the Delmarva Peninsula and cut off." the South from the North. And I mean, Clinton just kept peppering him with all these contradictory things at the same time saying, I don't like anything you've done. Uh, <laughs> it was just, uh, the whole thing became dysfunctional. Uh, British strategy for what it was worth, kind of shut down by, uh, uh, by, um, by mid-June, 1781. Um, Cornwallis tried to lure Lafayette into a, an ambush at Green Spring as he was moving to Portsmouth as, as uh, Clinton had directed him to ship away a lot of his army and he bloodied the Marquis' nose. The Marquis stayed away, stayed out of his reach uh, until Washington arrived in late September after that. But, uh, you know, uh, Clinton kind of kind of sabotaged the campaign as he did it in a couple, a couple other passive aggressive ways when Cornwallis was still in South Carolina. Um, and I can get into that if people want me to, but uh, I don't, uh, it, or it depends how deep they want me, they want me to go. All right. Um, just a reminder to everyone watching, if uh, you'd like your question asked, please put it into the Q&A section. All the questions I had in my queue up to this point, well, they were good. They were good. They were good questions. I, I appreciate it. There's a thoughtful audience out there you know, and a well informed audience. Like nothing less from uh, Valley Forge Park Alliance and, and their patrons. So, um, well, I don't see any other questions that have come in. So I will turn things back over to our host for tonight, Justin. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So uh, I would like to, to thank Professor Gregory Irwin. Uh, this was a fantastic talk. Uh, we're very appreciative for you joining us this evening. Uh, also, a uh, thank you to uh, Stephen Elliott, PhD. Uh, and uh, of course, all the Valley Forge Park Alliance volunteers who made this evening's event possible. Thank you again to our generous sponsor, Sharon H. and Bruce A. Gakey Foundation. Uh, and thank you to our audience. Thank all of you for. Uh, uh, participating in the discussion tonight. And uh, please keep an eye out uh, on the event calendar on the, the Valley Forge Park Alliance website, uh, as well as the e-news, which comes out, uh, because Lunch and Learn announcements uh, will be rolling in weekly, as well as the June 1st talk uh, with Brendan Burns, the last speaker series event for the season. Thank you very much, and good night.